Well, hello, hello. Welcome to this week's webinar. I'm really excited that you're here. Um, just thank you so much for spending the time with me. Uh, we have a great crowd every week and you guys ask uh, lots of good questions that I'm able to kind of work into the presentation and, um, and uh, people are still, still flooding in. Uh, we don't want to overload the zoom, the zoom software, but, uh, let's go ahead and just get started because we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of content to cover and this is week seven, week seven of .NET DevOps for architects. And the topic is telemetry and observability because without the ability to know what is happening with our software in a production environment or any environment, then we're just grasping for straws and we're trying to figure out sources to issues, uh, customer reports, all kinds of things. So it's really, really important that we know what the software is doing at any, any given time. And that is our topic for today. And so I am really glad that you are here. Um, if you are a regular webinar attendee, then you've heard what I'm about to say before. Um, but there's so many, so many more people tuning in all the time. I want to make sure that I don't uh, just skip it. Um, and you know, if you're if you're signing up for these webinars, if you're if you're uh, uh, studying for yourself and and reading books and um, signing up for sessions like these and going to conferences, that means that you want to get more done. Uh, you want to move faster. You want to produce higher quality for your team, for your for your company, for your customers. Um, and this series, .NET DevOps for Architects, it is guidance aimed at software leaders who want to enable their teams to be world-class. And I believe that every team can deliver world-class results if equipped with the right tool chain uh, process and standards. Now, all over the industry, software projects are hard, but yours doesn't have to be. And, and of course, if you don't change anything, then nothing is going to change. And if you're like everybody else, then, then you, you deal with delays and quality problems and tons of complicated choices in developing and growing or changing your software systems. And at, at clear measure, what we love to do is simplify the process and empower you to deliver world-class results, to move fast, deliver quality and run your systems with confidence. And in this, in this uh, day and age, everybody expects software projects to have delays kind of expected um, our process helps development teams get projects done on time. Also, everybody expects bugs. They tolerate them. There's a reason why people don't launch software on a weekday morning. Uh, and our process also improves quality. And finally, everyone expects to have to babysit their software systems as it's being used in production. But our process empowers teams to run their systems with confidence. And we've had a positive impact on over 100,000 developers in over 40 countries so far. And we're enabling more and more development teams to deliver for their organizations every day. And I just want to reinforce you, you, my friend, have what it takes. You can do it. All you need is the right process and the right tool belt. You have what it takes. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. You have what it takes. And I know from experience that if you map out your software delivery process and then automate it as a foundation, you will deliver more and you and your team will absolutely love the results. So uh, let's go ahead and dig in. And I think uh, while I was saying that lots and lots more people joined, um, by the way, uh, everyone who um, signed up will receive a link to the recording and it is perfectly fine if you share it with your colleagues um, on your team. So um, today's webinar is telemetry and observability, and uh, we're going to go. We're going to do an overview of that topic. We're going to discuss some of the common mistakes in that arena. We're going to talk about three critical elements to doing it well and to achieving observability characteristics in your software system, and then uh, talk about talk about what your next step should be. Uh, first, I want to give you a free offer for. Uh, my latest book, .NET DevOps for Azure, you can find it on Amazon. Um, it is out. And uh, just for uh, attending this webinar, send me an email and uh, I'll give you a free ebook version. Uh, we have an ebook version 
that uh, that I can give you. Um, I'm not going to post a link to it, but if you if you send me an email, then uh, then I'll get you a, a personalized ebook version of my book because I'd love you to have it, and it has a lot of uh, a lot of this information in it, and uh, it'll help you along. And uh, I want to give you something of value. You know. I don't want you to continue to be frustrated and sometimes trapped by the software that you work on, uh, the software that always seems to find a way to break upon deployment. Wow, it, I definitely understand, uh, for instance, lost weekends, surprise overtime due to software builds and deployments going poorly. Um, I can, I can kind of sense some of you nodding because we all experience it. We all experience it. So um, when, when you email me, I'll give you the book. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to read the book. Um, and then number two, I want you to go through the seven stages of a DevOps pipeline. They're in the book. And then number three, launch your own .NET DevOps pipeline. Use our public project that's illustrated in the book as a model. And if you do this, you will have a fully automated DevOps pipeline using Azure. And it'll enable you to move faster and, and with higher quality. Uh, another resource that I want to make sure that you're tuned into is the Azure DevOps podcast. You can find it in any of the podcast directories, or you can go to azuredevops.show, and it's a weekly podcast. I think the one out, uh, the one out this week um, is James Montemagno on what's latest with uh, Xamarin DevOps and what the DevOps process looks like for mobile applications, and we have uh, some more success stories coming down the line. And uh, shoot it, if you have a DevOps success story where you're deploying in the middle of the day with no drama, or you've got your cycle times down um, and, and they're predictable, uh, reach out to me, send me an email. I'd love to get your success story on the podcast. Okay, so the series has been what you see on the screen. And we are at the tail end, telemetry observation, all right? That's what we are going through today. And... Um, let's, let's dive right into the common mistakes um, in this area. So in this area, we're thinking, how do we know what our software is doing? Okay, logs have been around for a long time, but here's some very, very common mistakes in the, in the quest of um, what, knowing what our software is doing. The first mistake is leaving logs on production environments. And that's, that's very common. Everybody does it, but that's a mistake. I'll go into why. Um, and, and then secondarily, uh, using non-parsable log formats. So you have to manually read everything or scan it with your eyeballs uh, to know what's happening. And then three, mixing logging code with business logic and flow control code. The logging code goes everywhere and it just mixes in and it's hard to read. Um, and uh, you know, there's some pain involved with me involved with this. So let me go through the pain associated with each of these common mistakes. Um, and I'm actually going to ask a few questions that I want you to reflect on. And I'm going to put this up on the screen. And uh, I want you to think about your own situation. And just take, take a few seconds and really think about these questions. Okay, so I know that some of you are thinking, oh shoot, I don't know. What's, what's my slowest third party integration? I don't have timings. Um, you know, how do you know if your user had an error? Well, I don't know. I wait for them to tell me. Um, and so these are, some, these are some questions that can illustrate the importance of this area. Now, I wanna discuss the pain that can be associated with these, the common mistakes. Um, and just go one by one. So leaving logs on production environments. The problem with that is that only those with production access can look at your telemetry. And I'm using telemetry as a broad word, whereas logs is one type of telemetry. It is information that your software emits so that uh, you can monitor it, so that you can know what is happening. 
But if it's on production, then only those with production access can look at it and see what the various processes in your system are doing. Another problem is that you have to give more people production access just to be able to support the software. Now, when it comes down to the parsable log formats, if you don't use a parsable log format, then you have to look and manually scan log files to get an understanding of what the software is doing. Even if you are using a tool like Log Parser, which if you're using Log4Net or any other flat file logging format, Log Parser can work for you and kind of filter out, filter out uh, by time and date because those things tend to be deterministic. Um, but even with that, that that's all you have is time and date because that's what the tool can automatically parse out. Um, you know, flat file formats don't lend themselves to parsing tools unless you create a deterministic format for yourself. Now, if you've looked at IIS logs, those flat files do have a, a more deterministic uh, format. And so with, uh, with tabs or commas or predictable spacing patterns, um, you can create a deterministic format for yourself. Um, and so that is somewhat parsable, but it's not very flexible. And then third, mixing the logging code in with everything else. When you do that, then you have a hard time um, understanding what, what is doing logging and what is doing control flow. So, in the situation where something happens and you know that you don't know, you don't have enough information being emitted, what do you do? You add more logging statements and you add them everywhere. Then combined with your non-parsable format, you have a mountain of logs to sift through and all your source code is littered with logging statements, making the burden of maintaining and reading the code that much greater. And that logging code is everywhere now in your business logic, in your control flow, like MVC controllers. Every class that does anything has logging statements now. And it gets really, really cluttered. And you start to question why you're doing logging so much. Because your gut tells you that there's got to be a better way. And there is. So let's, uh, let's dive in and keep going. Um, and I want to talk about the cycle time view of the Onion DevOps model. If you've been to the previous webinars, I know a lot of you have that are on this call, uh, you've seen this before. And the principles here are that each layer is a concentric circle and the interior, interior cycles, they have to spin faster, more cycles for, than, uh, than the exterior ones. And um, this, this right here is one of the views of Onion DevOps. Now, individual developers in the middle will code and then they'll run their code, they'll, co they'll write some code, they'll run the code, many cycles before pushing the code to their teammates so that the team can produce a build that can then be shared with someone in product management who in turn will evaluate multiple builds to determine a build to release to the customer. And the customer will use the software and make requests for more changes. In addition, I've added another cycle just to highlight this observability topic but I've added the cycle beyond the feature development cycles. And this is the support cycle. Now let me illustrate, there's a problem. Maybe it's a user error, maybe it's a data issue, maybe it's a showstopper bug, but with a refined process um, that has uh, determinism and controlled cycle times, you can triage the support ticket and use the telemetry built into your system and know exactly what to do. Now, if the code does need to be changed, then the customer support team will be able to reproduce the issue and get it to whoever is in charge of your product management, who will then decide whether to stop the presses to work on it now or to schedule the fix for the next release cycle. And when the ticket is cleared for work, then the team will take it and make sure a solution is understood. Then the team will dispatch it to an engineer on the team to change the appropriate code who will then run through a code cycle and then they'll commit the code back to the source control repository so that the team can produce a build to provide back to product management who will verify the fix and then clear it for release. Then the customer will use it, verify that they are unblocked and that the problem is solved and the support ticket can be closed out. 
these nested cycle times are the structure of your DevOps process. And you are intentionally controlling the process of each cycle so that you have predictability. Then if you're not happy with the speed of a particular cycle, you can change it. You can analyze the steps that have to happen, how long each one takes, and then determine what to do to fix it. And if your software has no observability characteristics, or it takes forever and you're just manually reading log files on production, then you'll be stuck at the support ticket level trying to reproduce a problem. You'll expend a lot of effort trying to determine uh, if the issue exists for just one customer or more customers, if it's a data issue, configuration of an environment, or if some source code is the problem. And it'll take a long time to figure out what to do and who should be pulled into the issue. And so telemetry is your tool. It's a tool that you can use so that you build into the system more observable characteristics. Just like our industry went through a testability revolution 15 years ago. By the way, for anyone on this webinar who is less than 15 years in the industry, there was a time when people questioned whether building in automated tests was even worth it. Now it's an accepted and proven practice that's proven to be worth it. And it's accepted that not writing automated tests is considered malpractice. And so it's a good point of industry maturity. And I think that we'll get there with, with telemetry as well, where we'll, as an industry, really understand it well, and it'll, it'll have uh, some patterns that are widely adopted. Now, going back in time, logs have long been something that are kind of casually done. But with a faster cycle time that's needed by the businesses that we serve, we need to add the architectural characteristic of observability to our software systems so that we know at all times what they're doing. It's no longer uh, suitable or adequate just to have logging as the only type of telemetry be done as an implementation activity determined by uh, an individual team member, but we need to elevate it to a team level discussion, part of the design and the architectural structure of our software systems. So let's talk about the three essentials to gain observability. And the first one is centralizing the telemetry. And we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but we're talking about more than just logs, but we're going to centralize all the information, all the different types of information that the system needs to emit and record in order to provide the set of data that we can look at and query to know at all times what our software is doing. So we want to centralize the telemetry. Okay. We don't want to leave it on individual production servers, individual, uh, even cloud services. We want to take the telemetry from all of the processes running on all of the servers or services in your production environment or all of your production environments and centralize them into a place where they can be correlated together and queried. Next, we want to elevate the level of your logs to full telemetry. We want to fill in the gap with the types of data and I'm using the term data intentionally, the types of data to record. Flat file logs using Log4Net or InLog or the built-in trace listeners, that is just one type of telemetry. So we want to do more and we want to uh, fill in the gaps with the type of telemetry that's been emitted. We'll go into that in just a second. And then finally, we want to, we want to centralize all of the telemetry logic in a way that is suitable for querying, okay? Um, and we want to create a data warehouse that we can use in order to um, perform, essentially, to use an industry buzzword, so that we can perform data science experiments on that set of data to yield answers to questions, okay? So, um, furthermore, in the software itself. You notice the first one is centralizing the telemetry itself, and the second one is cent centralize the telemetry logic. Let me dive into what I mean by logic. One of the main problems 
with traditional logging and logging libraries and frameworks is that all of the documentation says, here's how to use it. You sprinkle it throughout all of your code and then you're left with a code base that is just absolutely littered with logging statements. And it makes the code harder to read. And so what we wanna do is we want to centralize the logic that actually emits telemetry. We do not want telemetry emitting logic or logging statements to be everywhere in every code file. We should have, we should have these logging statements be in very, very few code files and use a, a coding pattern that centralizes that logic. We don't want every code file to have a logging statement. We want the vast majority, we're talking about 90% per here. We want 90% of your code files to have zero logging statements because you have centralized them. And that way, as your system grows, you're not just adding an additional tax of, oh, I need to do the feature. Oh, but then I need to instrument this feature because now for every one line of code, I need two lines of logging statements in order to, to record what it's doing. No, that pattern is not sustainable. And unfortunately, that pattern is everywhere. There are code bases everywhere with logging statements, just littering everything, kind of journaling what the code is doing instead of providing uh, the story of why the code is doing it and, and in what order and what context. So we'll go into that in just a second. Now here's a bit of a structure uh, for a application that's deployed in Azure using uh, some of the platform as a service uh, offerings. And for each of the environments, now Application Insights is a really good um, Azure APM tool to centralize and record telemetry. You also have Stackify and New Relic, and, there, and there's, there's plenty other products out there, but it's important you pick one. Now, with, in the case of Application Insights, it is geared to use uh, one instance per environment. And so you would, you would uh, correlate that there. And then Log Analytics uh, can also absorb logs from all kinds of all kinds of services, any kind of flat file format can be centralized into a log analytics instance and it, it'll be kind of parsed and put into a data format where it can be queried. Whereas your application insights, you use that directly in your applications themselves. So if I were to map this to the, the runtime architecture, then you'd have uh, your, your web application using a app service which would then emit the information into Application Insights. You'd have an offline job running as an Azure function doing the same thing. You have a SQL Server database running inside Azure SQL that would be doing the same thing. And then you'd have full system tests that are active in your DevOps pipeline that are also emitting telemetry to Application Insights because that also helps for your, your team cycle when a, when a build breaks or a test suite breaks, uh, you know what it was doing. Now, just to give you a taste of a feature set of what you get for free, just by adding the Application Insights NuGet packages, all of this information right here, you get for free. You don't have to write a single line of code. You just configure it in. You don't need to write any logging statements and um, lots, of, uh, lots of information will automatically be emitted out just from, by the fact that you're using the .NET framework because the .NET framework itself is instrumented and it automatically turns on with application insights. And so things like database queries, uh, if you're using Entity Framework, you automatically get database query um, uh, logging. Now it doesn't, it doesn't log the parameters obviously because that's data, but the fact that the query happened and what it happened and then the timings and how long it took. Um, so it's, it, that one you get a lot for free even without writing any code. Also, Another type of telemetry that I talked about when we were going through automated deployments was the deployment marker. And this is where at the beginning of your routine to deploy your application, you want to essentially record that you're starting a deployment. And so this marker that's highlighted is a deployment marker and you can see the time on the timeline of when that deployment happened. So if any of the performance characteristics start to go sideways or improve if you're expecting that, 
then you can see that it's correlated with the deployment. So you want to not only instrument uh, what the application features are doing, but you also want to instrument what your DevOps pipeline is doing. Now I talked about centralizing the logic of, of emitting telemetry and, cent and centralizing your, your instrumentation. This is an example of what that could look like. Um, if you have a particular, and I know a lot of you centralize uh, data access logic behind interfaces and centralize it so that you don't have MVC controllers or business logic classes just automatically reaching out and doing a query to the database. You centralize the query or writing to a database um, in a dedicated code file implementing an interface, very common pattern. And so you can do the same thing with, uh, with your instrumentation here. And one thing that's, that's really interesting to use is a hub and spoke pattern so that you don't have, you don't have all of your code even knowing about the iTelemetry sync interface, for example. But if you package up the user's intent as a command or a query or an event, if, if you've ever heard of CQRS, um, if you package up the user's intent as an object, then the object can flow through an execution pipeline and then your instrumentation can see that that is happening and emit the telemetry around that user's request and then it automatically happens because you've given yourself an architectural pattern to handle cross-cutting concerns. And instrumentation of telemetry is just one cross-cutting concern uh, along with many others. And so giving yourself an execution pipeline inside your application uh, is a really important architectural pattern, regardless of what type of application you're using. If you're, if you're not using a, a pattern like that, then not only is the instrumentation code here painful, but I'm guessing security code is, is painful, auditing uh, is painful, and lots of other cross-cutting concerns are painful, where you look at what you're doing and you think, man, just to do this one new thing, I have to sprinkle this code throughout how many code files in my, in my application? And it just gets insane. So you wanna make sure that you, you equip yourself with an architectural pattern that gives yourself a pinch point in, in the application so that things like this can just, can just watch what's happening at the pinch point instead of having to sprinkle code like this everywhere. Now, I talked about different types of telemetry and how logging is only one type. Uh, I wanna dive into that. These are the three types on the screen. It's not complicated. Logs are one type and it's kind of the expository of, oh, something happened, this happened, yada, yada, and it could be at any level of detail. The other two are what enable your telemetry to yield you a true set of data and something that would rise to the level of a data warehouse uh, because you probably create a data warehouse or, or a um, star schema or a reporting database for some of your own customers or, or users of your software. And they need reports and they need to be able to query things and they need to be able to turn data into intelligence, turn data into business answers. And so they need a set of data that gives them the capability to do that, to know what's going on with their business data. This is the same way to think about it with telemetry. You are, you are capturing all kinds of information as the software is used every day, and you are continually adding and building up a set of data for yourself, a data warehouse for yourself, the whole bunch of just raw data, but it's structured in such a way where you can query it and turn that data into information, turn that data into answers, turn that data into line graphs, into bar charts, connect Power BI and Excel Power Pivot to that set of data. And so events and metrics are key to giving you the type of recorded data that are the building blocks of a data warehouse. Now, even if you haven't intended it to be this way, uh, most reporting databases this year, this, in these uh, current days, which are, 
are denormalized or star schemas, absolutely, and analysis cubes, definitely, uh, have at their center fact tables. And the Kimball method of data warehouse uh, patterns have dimensions and facts as basic building blocks. And dimensions are strings that you put into group by statements in a SQL query. And facts are numbers that you put into aggregation functions like sum, min, max, average. And so, and so if you have an event, which is a string, a label, and you give every function, every behavior in your application a name, well, now you have named events that this function just happened or is happening or is starting. And then a metric can be something as simple as the number of milliseconds that it took to do something or counts or any other number that makes sense in your application. And so when you record an event, you also record it with all of the metrics or the numbers that make sense for that event. And of course, duration can tend to be the, the, a common one. And also additional dimensions go with the events like the current user or the current region or uh, where this user in the, in the country happened to be. And so you want to make sure that not only do you have your flat file logs and you centralize them, but you also instrument your application to, to emit as an event every function that happens and associate metrics with it. And that'll yield you the data set where you can literally connect Excel to it. You can connect Power BI, you can connect Tableau, any of the data analysis tools that other people in your business already use. And you now have a full data warehouse where you can query it and pull out line graphs. Um, and it's just a huge enabling set of data when you equip yourself this way. So let's review the three essentials. Uh, you're gonna centralize the actual telemetry. So pull it away from those production environments into one place where you can access it without having to access production and people who don't, who don't and shouldn't have access to the production environment can access it. You're gonna elevate your logs and add more types than just the flat file logs. You're gonna add metrics, you're gonna add events uh, to your, your set of telemetry and then you're gonna centralize the logic. Instead of sprinkling logging and instrumentation lines of code everywhere all throughout your code base, you're gonna create for yourself an architectural pattern that gives you a pinch point so that you only have to put it in ideally one place, but a very, very small number of places so that all of your application is instrumented. Those are the three essentials. All right, so I have really enjoyed this webinar series. We have gone through just a ton of information. We've gone through the design steps that have to happen before you put your hands on keyboard and write code, how a version control system needs to be structured, uh, given that it is the headwaters of a DevOps pipeline. If you don't get that right, the rest of it's not gonna be right. Uh, what goes into building the software, private builds, integration builds, uh, how to enable yourself with a full system test suite, how to, uh, how to design and verify user experience testing and automated deployments, infrastructure as code. And now we just went over uh, how to bake in observability characteristics into your code base, into your software via telemetry. Now, put it on your calendar. We're gonna announce the exact start time, but next week, next Thursday morning, we are going to have, and we're, we haven't even announced this publicly, this is the webinar topic for next week. And it is file new DevOps project. And we're gonna do it in 15 minutes. Now the webinar will be about 30 minutes, but I'm going to equip you with a way of going from absolutely nothing to a fully automated DevOps process in 15 minutes. And I'm not talking about the, the quick starts that just don't do anything that's practically just automated compile. I'm talking about everything that we have talked about in this entire series with the private build, integration build, three levels of test automation, the, the pinch point pattern that I just talked about for instrumentation, um, automated deployments. We will create automatically uh, Azure PaaS environments from ARM templates stored in source control, provision those in Azure, you will have a three 
level uh, environment pipeline. And in 15 minutes, you will go from nothing to having your new application in three different environments in Azure. And if you want to take and, and jumpstart a new application like that, if you're about to start something that is generally the shape of a .NET Core web application, some type of offline job and a SQL database, if you have something that's generally that shape, then this can literally jumpstart you in 15 minutes. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to walk you through and I'm going to give you the tools to do it. And so um, make sure to come prepared next week with your uh, Azure subscription as where you can follow along. Of course, you'll be able to, to follow along through the recording right afterwards. But bring your teammates because this is a huge culmination of so many things that we've talked about up until now. And you are going to get up and running in 15 minutes. It is going to be insane. And your mind is going to be blown at how simple this process can be when you just do it the right way. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complicated. But at the same time, it needs to be robust. It needs to be complete. And it can't just be demo wear and short circuiting things. We need to bake in all of these capabilities into our environment um, so, that, uh, so that we can run at a sustainable pace, but without friction. So that's really exciting. Stay tuned. All right. So what do you need to do next? Remember, send me an email so that I can send you a free copy of my book. And as you, as you read the book, use the included Azure DevOps Services Project template um, so that you know the structure. I'm going to help you get that structure that's in the book up and running in 15 minutes next week. Also, be sure to subscribe to my podcast, the Azure DevOps Podcast. And if you have a success story or know somebody that does, send me an email and tune in next week. Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to get that new project going. So thank you so much. Uh, I believe that I was able to answer the questions uh, in line. No new questions come through. Okay, good. And uh, all of you will receive a, uh, a link to access the recording. You can share it with your teammates. And I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I really, really enjoy sharing this information with all of you. And as you are on your journey to DevOps excellence, and I just want to reinforce you again, you can do it. You have what it takes. The right tooling with the right uh, processes, you can do all of this. Have a great day.